Homeowner's insurance is not only a problem for those looking to purchase, but also a problem for those that have purchased in the last couple of years. And that's what we're going to be talking about in today's episode. We're going to be diving into the world of insurance, how it is affecting those that are looking to purchase, how it's affecting those that already own homes, and what's likely to happen with all of these changes in the near future. So Josh, let's just start with a really basic definition. Webster, if you will, what is insurance and then why is it important? So it is a practice or arrangement by which a company provides a guarantee of compensation for specified loss. Here's the important part we're going to go into, Jeb, in return for payment of a premium. So for us on the mortgage side, for you in real estate, trying to close transactions, we are very familiar with that premium is. And we're going to talk today, those premiums have gone up. But in essence, you make a monthly payment to protect yourself against having a catastrophic loss in the future. If the potential for a loss was something that you just had money sitting in the bank, you'd say, why would I pay you every month? Because we know Mm -hmm. companies, corporations, the people offering this insurance do this to make a profit. So they can say, we spread the risk off of hundreds of thousands of homeowners. We take in a premium. And when the few homeowners have a loss, we pay them. Well, that generates a little bit of a profit. And that is the problem, both in terms of the increase in losses here recently, and then uh, government intervention by certain state governments thinking that they should just say, hey, you can't charge. You cannot charge what the risk actually is for insuring homes in our state. So that's the crux of it, but we're going to go into a lot more detail on that. Yeah. And as homeowners, like for example, you know, own a home for 15, 20 years, never have an insurance claim. Many people out there think that's a waste of money. Why am I spending, you know, 1,200, 13, 15, 2,000, 5,000, whatever the number is, depending on the state that you're located in per year and getting absolutely nothing out of it. It's kind of like me spending health insurance my entire life being healthy adult, and then something does happen to your family, you get this monster bill, and then you realize, well, that monster bill has been cut significantly because of insurance, right? And so these insurance companies are essentially protecting themselves, right? Because a lot of states, for example, can go years without having natural disasters, without having crazy things happen. Florida, for example, right? No major hurricanes in the last five to 10 years, you know, and and therefore insurance premiums in theory should be less because there's less risk out there, but maybe the risk is on the other side, the risk of something coming down the pike, if you will. So Josh, let's talk about what's happened over the last couple of years, because you know we know we've helped a lot of homeowners over the last couple of years purchase during the pandemic. They were able to get interest rates uh, significantly lower than where we sit today. Uh, and with that, housing affordability was was really good for a lot of people out there. But what we've seen since then is, you know, our premise is always fix your housing costs as early in your life as you possibly can, right? Because you're protecting yourself against rising rents and things that you're somewhat out of your control. Well, one of those things that are out of your control is homeowner's insurance. So why are we seeing this increase over the last couple of years? And how is that going to impact people um, that are looking to purchase and that already own? When you're an insurer, your purpose is to make a profit by providing this service of insurance to people. So you have to say, okay, how many losses are we likely to have? Then what is that loss severity? What does that cost us? So we're, we're seeing just a massive increase in the number of claims. So for us in California, the big one is wildfires. And that's not just in California. We've had wildfires in Washington. I believe there were some out in Colorado. So a lot of the Western states where it's more dry, where we have things that can burn, we've had wildfires. Um, We've had wind issues, um, tornadoes, hurricanes have not been a huge issue, except for we did have Hurricane Ian in Florida a few years. And we talked about in the headlines, where are the two areas that are suffering from this? Florida and California the most, but it is a nationwide problem. So you have that issue of fire, hurricane, flood, um, which the well, funny thing is we haven't seen that for a few years. But a lot of times through the Midwest, uh, you'll see Iowa farmland, just whole cities underwater when they get these big floods. So that is what we're insuring for. But then we all are familiar with our pocketbooks on a day-to-day basis, but also us in the live every week, we hear people saying this inflation is nuts. You know, this costs too much, that costs too much. This went up that much. Well, once that loss comes into place and a house burns down, building that house 
is much, much more expensive than it was. Rebuilding that house, I should say, is much more expensive than it was five years ago. So whether it's a small job where you have little water damage in your house and they have to come in and replace a subfloor, put in a new shower, replace some plumbing, that's expensive. But if a whole house is gone, uh, if a roof uh, you know, gets fire damage and it has to be replaced, everything is much, much more expensive. So these companies are having more claims and the claims that they are having are having a greater claim uh, severity where they're paying out more money. So the kicker on top of this, Jeb, we have a state government here in California that they subscribe to this belief, which we've seen. We've seen throughout the pandemic in Washington, D.C. Politicians love to get on TV and talk about um, the price gouging. These corporations are trying to make too much money. And so in California, they said, hey, we don't believe that insurance companies are actually a cost to insuring. So we're going to cap what you can charge for insurance. Uh -huh. So what we've seen in the state of California is insurance companies have reacted by saying, cool, we will not insure homes in your state because you have put a cap on what we can charge. And with that cap, we cannot make a profit. So our, we're not a public utility. So it sort of transitions into what are a lot of people getting forced into in California and in certain other states is government issued insurance, California Fair Plan, where the, the state ends up taking on that risk because they've chased away actual insurers who know how to do this and can do it well. And they're giving you minimal basic coverage at fairly high premiums. But that insurance fund is underfunded. Like we don't know what's going to happen. If we get a gnarly wildfire season here in California, mm -hmm. where California is now the insurer because through brilliant government policies, they've chased all of the insurers out of California because they can't make a profit. It could bankrupt the state. We, we really don't know where that's going. But in the short run, what do we know, Jeb? We know 23 to 2024, Insurify is saying that premiums will go up 6%. Over the past two years, their premiums are up 20%. And I don't know about you, Jeb, I bought my house in 2003. From 2003 to about 2015, I don't know that the premiums moved. If they did, it was like 2%, like un unnoticeable. Part of the reason on that is because of these caps that the insurance or that the state had on these, insur these insurers to start with. So the reason you didn't see increases is because the state wasn't allowing it. It, it. At least that's what my insurance broker was saying because I saw a big jump this year, not necessarily in homeowner's insurance so much as car insurance. And I reached out and I was like, why are we now paying? Why am I paying more for my car now? It's it's a year less older, you know, whatever. Why, why are costs going up? And he basically said, listen, there's been a cap on this for so long. California just raised or change that. And so now all of these insurance companies are moving up the premiums as high as the state essentially will allow them so that they can make money, if you will, instead of being this uh, break even point. And it seems crazy because I know there's people out there going, yeah, these companies make way too much money. You know, they're overpaid, whatever. It's easy to say that until you actually have a problem and you need someone and then you need that insurance to to protect you if you will so you know states california florida are big issues um but you know i guess the question that a lot of people have out there josh is is this going to be something that's going to continue are are these people that are having that are struggling already because of inflation struggling because of the economy just in general it's slowing um potentially losing jobs are you going to have rising costs? Are costs going to continue to rise? And are people going to be forced to sell? Is this a is this something that forces someone to say, I can no longer afford my house because costs are continuing to be out of control and now you flood the market with inventory? Is that is that something that could happen? Could it happen? Yeah, because let's let's use the example. If if that is your belief that you think that is what's going to happen, you're looking at the Gulf Coast of Florida right now, and you're saying they are having a large increase in inventory. They're back. Are they right at or just above? The bit, above their 2019, inventory. I think. Yeah, they're okay, above so 2019. They're back to 2019 yeah. levels. The only where in the country, and you look and you go, well, why is that? Well, there was big hurricane losses big increases to insurance costs. So a lot of people looking at a $300,000 house that was at a 3% interest rate is now at a 7% interest rate. And they go, wait, and my insurance, if I had bought three years ago, would have been $2,500 a year. And now it's $7,500 a year. That's three or $400 a month. In addition to the 800, 1,000, $1,200 from 
the increase in, in mortgage rates. So it's just another hit to affordability. And you, you have to say, what can fix insurance costs? You need these state governments to, to literally get a clue, to say, we need these companies. Um, California has some very unique uh, issues where when an insurance company goes so I, what, we, what one of the things you were saying, Jeb, is I kind of wanted to circle back to insurance is unique. These companies can't be making trillions over here and going, hey, we're broke. We need to raise the premiums. Their premiums go to the insurance board and have to be approved. So once the insurance commissioner has to approve them, they're published. And then all of these are publicly held companies. You can see their their financial results. So they, they can't hide profits. We know whether they're making money or losing money. So when State Farm last week comes out and says, hey, we're canceling all these apartment policies and we're not writing any new ones in California, they can point and go, here's the books, guys. We lost money on these. We're not doing it anymore. But interestingly, California also allows third parties to show up at these hearings when the insurance companies and ask to raise their premiums and say, uh, this is in the bad, not in the interest of the public. We can't allow this. And you're like, this is nuts. I, they actually have a word for it. I, I forget what they, what they call interveners. They call them interveners that can challenge and delay requested rate increases. So if State Farm today could go make a perfect case to the insurance commissioner and say, hey, we're going broke. We're either going to leave or we can stay here and we can insure at this cost. Can we charge these premiums? Even if the insurance commissioner says, yeah, we're cool with that. You have a two, three, four year court process of interveners who are not homeowners, who are not apartment owners, who don't have any say in it, but they get to step in and say, no, we don't think so. And we're going to fight it legally for a, a number of years. So we just have an insane legal system throughout the United States, but especially in certain of these states, um, which you, you really, we, we've, we talk about this and we see this all the time, Jeb, you couldn't have more polar opposite states. Our governor here in California, Newsom, versus their governor in Florida, they almost want to, to make every policy the exact opposite. But it's interesting that these are the two states that are suffering from it the most. You and I are in California, so I'm more familiar with the insanity of what we're doing here in California, of basically chasing insurers away. But you asked a simple question. Is this going to get better? Is this going to moderate? Or is this going to reverse? And we've seen inflation has lingered on longer than people thought at a higher rate than people thought. Is inflation at a really high rate of increase right now? It's not. It's at three, three and a quarter percent, depending on which measure you look at. But that's 50 percent higher than what we've seen over the last 15 or 20 years. So historically, it's a pretty decent measure, but relatively it's high compared to what we've seen. And most importantly, we had that spike over two, three years where no one remembers the 15 years before that, where we barely even saw 2% inflation. They just look back the last three years and say things are 35, 38, 40% more expensive than they were three years ago. So I, I don't know about you. I don't see much unwinding that. And we have this belief that whether it's whatever it is that we are having more disasters and they are having higher loss severity and due to inflation, the cost of covering and insuring those losses is increasing. So there will be a solution, but I don't know that the solution is is baked into the cake where prices are going to moderate. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Now, I want to ask the listener, the viewer something at the moment. Does this make home ownership less advantageous for you? What are your thoughts on that? Let us know in the comments below. If you're listening on Spotify, you can send us an email. Um, you can, you, we'll do actually a poll on this too. You can go and answer it on whatever platform you're listening to. And if you like content like this, do us a favor, hit the thumbs up. It's a little bit different than the content that we normally do, but it's all really about educating the homeowner so that you guys are fully equipped to navigate that process. Um, and if you, again, you, you like content like this, do us a favor and hit that thumbs up. So Josh, we've asked the, 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 the viewers, the listeners, that question. I'm going to ask you that question. Does this make homeownership less advantageous in the short term with housing affordability being basically at the worst levels we've ever seen? You've got rising costs potentially with some states' taxes, right? So not only are you getting insurance increases, you're also getting tax increases. What are your thoughts? I think it will absolutely scare some people away. We have a lot of people, and rightfully so. When you have been a, a renter or you've lived with your parents and you're getting to the age where, hey, ready to move out, ready to spread my wings, go out on my own, it is a scary process. When I remember when I bought my first place, I was living at home with my dad. And the thought of, hey, I go from $0 and, mm -hmm. and I can save almost all the money I make to next month I have a multi-thousand dollar payment. 
that's scary. And it's scary for everyone. So when you're seeing these headlines, and these are legitimate things, this isn't a boogeyman thrown out there. These are legitimate things. What I would say is it will impact your thinking, but don't be confused into thinking that this is only going to impact homeowners. You as a renter don't pay the insurance directly. You're not writing that uh, that uh, bill when it comes every due every year, but you are most certainly paying it. So we talk about multiple things. There's a supply and demand element. So we have limited supply of rentals. We have limited supply of for sale homes and we have record high demand due to demographics and generational changes. So when we look at that, that's not likely to change. So when you have the underlying costs of being an apartment owner, Mm -hmm. a single family home owner that you're going to rent out, you're looking at this saying, what is my cost of owning this? Can I pass that on to the person getting the benefit or the use of that home? And as long as we have the supply and demand levels that we have right now, Mm -hmm. owners, renters, landlords will be able to pass these costs on to renters. So you're not going to be insulated from them as a tenant. Um, You just won't see them as directly. So it's going to impact everyone who has to put a roof over their head and it will keep it will keep some people from buying. It will keep some people living in multi-generational, situa- multi-generational situations with family longer. Um, you can't look at an issue this big and say it won't impact the housing market in any way. Well, it kind of reminds me, Josh, of our, our, our state government here raising the minimum wage to $20 an hour. They think, hey, that's only going to help the employees there. It's not going to affect anyone else. Guess what? It's going to affect everyone, the owners of those businesses, the people paying the food, the people that made the policy. It's going to affect them, too. It, at the end of the day, it's it's one of those things that it, it literally just bleeds through to the next person. And it's going to continue to be a problem. But you made some really, um, you know, a really valid point is that you pay it as the person on the other side. You laugh and you go, ha ha ha, I'm a renter. I don't have to deal with that. No, you do because now instead of the the uh, owner of that building increasing the rent 2% or 3%, maybe they're raising it 5 Maybe they're pushing the limits in some of these places, whereas before they were a little nicer. Hey, just stay in the property. You've been a great tenant. We're not going to raise the cost. Well, guess what? Cost is probably going to go up because that, that landlord's not in the business of you know um, losing money. A lot like the the people here in, um, in in California and and that left the state because of you know the insurance companies that left the state because they're not in the business of losing money either. So, you know, with that, Josh, if you're not able to raise the cost because there's limited you know uh, limitations because of government intervention that sort of thing, um, we've kind of talked about that. Uh, and you do have rising costs. I asked you this question earlier, and we kind of went around it. Does this cause people to sell property? Are you going to have people that need to liquidate assets uh, because of affordability? Because I think that's the premise. The premise out there is that nobody can afford this. Therefore, everybody has to sell and all this property is going to flood the market. It's going to drive down prices. Everything's going to crash. Yay, I'm able to buy a property for 30 cents on the dollar. Let's look at the, the bigger picture there are differences among areas. Now I am by no means a Florida expert, but I've got a number right here. The state average homeowner's insurance in Florida right now is $11,759 a year. Holy cow. That's almost a thousand dollars a month. Until very recently, I was paying a thousand dollars a year. I would have to pull mine up right now, but I think it's somewhere between fourteen and fifteen hundred dollars a year. So when you say you look at a house and and my house is probably twice as expensive as an entry level home in Anaheim. But still, maybe it's $1,000 for annual insurance, $1,200 for annual insurance there, because largely the difference is the lot value of my home is much higher, right? The value of my home, it's not that much more. If they both burn down, that entry-level home in Anaheim is not that much cheaper to rebuild than my house in Huntington Beach. So from an insurer's perspective, that's what they're looking at. So that person in Anaheim is paying $1,200. I'm paying $1,400, $1,500. Now, if we go a little bit further out to Anaheim Hills or Tribuco Canyon, those people are paying five, six, seven thousand dollars a year, and they are probably not paying their fair share. The potential of loss and the severity of loss will be much, much higher for those folks out there. And that takes me back to Florida. The insurers in Florida are saying twelve thousand dollars a year is what it takes to fairly insure you against the likelihood of, of storm damage, hurricane damage, water damage, all that fun stuff. 
So when we look at that, we have to go back and look at the market as a whole. We've talked about these numbers. 40% of homes in the U.S. are owned free and clear. Do we think homeowners insurance going from $1,000 to $2,000 or $3,000 a year makes those 40% of people sell their home? Pretty unlikely. And if it did, it would be a a small percentage of them. It wouldn't be a large number of them. So now of the 60% that own homes, we ran through the numbers on the live show last week, Jeb, 62% are at, have, have 40% or more equity in their property. So again, very insulated from this. And if they were to sell that home, they're still going to be paying homeowners insurance. They're just going to be paying it to the landlord in the form of the rent. So don't big picture. I don't want anyone listening to here say, Josh is saying, oh, it's not a big deal. It's not going to impact the market. It will absolutely impact the market. It is impacting the market, but there's not really a place to hide for someone that needs shelter. So there will be impacts, significant impacts at the margins. The people who recently bought, who didn't properly budget, if you bought in Florida last year with a three and a half percent down FHA and you lose your job this year and your insurance goes up $2,000 more a year, that's a recipe for a problem. Mm -hmm. But for most of the people, it's not. And when we look back, when people keep wanting, hoping, wishing, praying that we're going to get 2008 all over again, you have to get yourself into a situation where the people didn't qualify for the loan to begin with. They put little down and didn't didn't benefit from any appreciation at the end of that cycle. So they have no equity. They have nothing to fight over, fight for to stay and remain in that house. And they don't have the ability to do it, which we just don't have that same formula. Does that mean that there can't be a downturn, that the only type of downturn is 2008? No. For us in California, California has always been cyclical. About every 10 to 15 years, we have an up and a down cycle here. But that generally looks like 10, 12, 15% correction in prices after a big run up. Home prices would go up 50, 60% and then drop 12 or 15% and then start another leg up. So we're in a unique situation. And we've talked about this on the show before. You and I are of a similar opinion that we are likely to see a protracted period of lesser inflation in home prices rather than some crash or correction due to supply and demand. So the question here comes back, is this insurance issue going to lead to a flood of supply that overwhelms the amount of able demand of people who can afford to buy in the market? I don't think so, but we are seeing it have an impact in Florida and that could spread to other markets. Is this a nationwide contagion? I don't think so in any way, but it's something that that bears watching. And if you're looking at buying in one of these areas, especially as a first time buyer mm-hmm. with anything less than a, a, a significant, meaning 20% plus down payment, you have to take this into your calculus when you're thinking of, of do I buy? No, and, and I think the best advice we can give you coming from you know the 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 podcast the the channel here in in educating you right it's all about being the educated home buyer is as soon as you're going through that pre-approval process and you get pre-approved with a Josh um, which you can do by clicking on the referral link in the description below you can work directly with our team here um, but you know once you're getting pre-approved Josh is going to do an estimate right for insurance they're going to always estimate but here's the deal don't rely on that estimate go out and talk to an insurance a professional, a broker, someone that does insurance, give them an idea of what you're trying to purchase so that you can get an accurate number to plug in and make sure that, oh yeah, Josh's number was accurate or no, maybe Josh's number was a little low. I need to budget this amount. That way, you know, because what happens typically, at least Josh, you can kind of uh, give give your side of this because you deal with it way more often than I do is people get into the pre-approval process They go, they've done everything that they need to do. But one of the conditions you need is you need to see the declaration page of the insurance premium, right? Most people don't do that until they have to do that, until they're already in the loan process. Sometimes they've released contingencies on certain things and then they're finding out, oh shoot, like my insurance is another $100 a month or more than I thought it was gonna be. So do your due diligence up front, put yourself in the best position, Budget properly, accordingly, um, and that way you're, there aren't surprises, right? It doesn't mean costs aren't going to go up. It just means, hey, you know what they're going to be going into it, and then you can budget accordingly going forward. So, Josh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that piece? I would say absolutely. If you're going to be buying a home, first-time buyer, move-up buyer, investment buyer, any buyer, 
do this very early in the process. If I were out looking at purchasing a home right now, I would literally do it before I got a home under contract. I would say, this is the type of home. This is the area that I'm looking at buying. Can you get me a reasonable quote of what this would look like? It's not going to be dead on, but it'll get you in the ballpark. But from our end, we can send out your original loan estimate with an estimate on the insurance. But by the time we get to that closing disclosure, we've got to be tightening that up. And that has to go back to the underwriter. The underwriter has to sign off on that. So here's an example, Jeb, we have a listener to the show. We're doing a refinance for, he's out in Riverside. We gather all of his documentation. One of the things on a refinance that we collect is the declarations page from the insurance. We get it, escrow calls to update the loss payable to the new lender and the insurance company goes, oh, we canceled that policy a month ago. You're like, what in the world happened? Call the borrower. Borrower reaches out to his lender and his lender goes, yeah, that's not a highly rated enough company. So their uh-huh. insurer had had some changes and the, the mortgage company said, no, they're not highly rated enough. So I went to help him get a policy in place and we got a quote within 24 hours, but they said we need A, B, C, and D. And it's going to take from the time that we receive that about 14 days to be able to bind this policy. So that is common. So a a lot of what I'm getting right now, Jeb, is, hey, how quickly can we close? Can we close in 17 days? Can we close in 21 days? Yes. Can you get insurance in that time frame? It's something that you need to put at the very beginning of the process and that we are trying to do when we get a contract in reach out to that buyer, please start working on your insurance today because it's going to take longer than expected. And you may be surprised at what that premium looks like. And it could impact our debt to income ratio and our approval. No, good stuff. Uh, you know, I, like I asked earlier in the show, if you guys find content like this valuable, do us a favor and hit the thumbs up. Actually, leave us a comment too and let us know if you want more information like this, kind of outside of the home buying and selling idea, right? It's talking about general things in in the process of of buying a home. And if you have ideas, you know, you can let us know those as well. It, it makes for a better show when the, when the content's actually coming directed at exactly what you want to know. Uh, but with that, Josh, I, th- I think we have, you know, laid out, the most important piece here is that insurance costs are a problem. Um, it's something that you need to pay attention to if you're out there looking to buy a home. If you're a homeowner, just make sure you know you're you know you can get quotes right. Just like you can talk to multiple lenders, you can talk to mul- multiple insurance people. I I've had the same insurer for over 10, 15 years. Over fifteen years, I just changed insurers this year because I was able to get a, a different policy with someone else that was better for me and my family. So I was able to switch and. That only happened because I actually went out there and talked to a couple of different people and one was just way better at communicating than the other. So with that, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Along those lines, though, I want to, I want to piggyback off that one. Hel- trying to help that client the other day, I reached out to my broker. He says, we literally only have one insurer writing policies right now. So I'm a broker, but I'm not brokering anything for you. I'm going to get you one quote. He says, here's a couple of sources that we don't work with that you guys can check. That's weird. That is unique when you have a broker telling you, hey, this is a different situation. Here's a couple of options to work around it. So what you said, whether you take it upon yourself to shop or you get some help in it, you need you need to have that that guidance and, and help because it's it's a unique market right now and you want to be able to get multiple numbers so that you're getting a the, the best number of what your your you and your property are eligible for. Absolutely. So guys, we appreciate you listening. We appreciate the support. We'll see you next time. Adios. Amigos.